In this video, we'll be taking a look at one of the most enduring poems from the Victorian era and asking ourselves the question, why is it so inspirational? Welcome to a reading, summary, and analysis of Rudyard Kipling's If. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about don't deal in lies, or being hated don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools. Or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count on you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. So in terms of the poem's summary, it's actually a pretty straightforward piece for something from the Victorian era. I did put some definitions in the text box below in case that's helpful for you, but for the most part I don't think we need to dwell on what exactly these words mean. In the first stanza, you get this pattern set up, though, which is pretty interesting here. It starts A, 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 A. So the first four lines rhyme with one another, but after that, the rhymes skip a line, and it follows that pattern all the way through. And I think this interchanging rhyme scheme works really well for this poem because there's a real balancing act, and you can really just pick out any phrase of the poem and see that balancing act. So in the first stanza here, we have, for instance, keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. So you keep a level head while everyone else is blaming it on you. Trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. So you have this sort of binary approach there, trust and doubt, and this balancing act. So the BCBC BC rhymes, I think, work really well with that. The first four lines rhyming together is an interesting choice, and I I have a little bit of a theory on that, but we'll talk about that later in the poem, so stick around with that. In the second stanza here, I reset the rhyme scheme for every stanza just because I didn't want to get into like the letters J and K. That seems a little ridiculous, but do know that the A in stanza 2 does not rhyme with the A in stanza 1, so that can be a little confusing. This is just my personal preference. When I mark rhyme scheme, I like to go stanza by stanza unless the different stanzas rhyme with each other so that I can see the pattern a little bit quicker. One of my favorite things about stanza two is how you see a few words that are capitalized here. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, one of my favorite phrases in the entire poem. So triumph and disaster are personified as imposters. And it's a really great piece of advice. In a lot of ways, this is an advice poem. Kipling wrote it partly for a politician who was going through some things and also for his son. But getting beyond the biographical reading here, I think this advice applies to everyone. And that's why I like to kind of stick more within the poems. Anyway, getting off track. Triumph and disaster being seen as imposters and treating them the same. That life will have triumphs, really high highs, and life will have disasters. And I kind of think that YouTube in general is a good way of thinking about this. Sometimes I'll have a video that gets thousands of views, and sometimes I have a video that'll get hundreds of views. And if I judged my channel or my hobby or if it became my profession one day just on how one video did, whether it was a triumph or disaster, I would be kind of losing my mind. 
because even if a video does incredible, that doesn't mean the next video will or the next 30 videos will. And just because a video did terrible does not mean all the future videos will do terrible as well. As we move into the third stanza, there is some interesting vocabulary here, especially the pitch and toss, which is a gambling game involving uh, throwing coins, and whoever gets the closest coin gets all of it. So in this stanza, you see if you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. That's one of the longest phrases in the poem. A lot of phrases are one to two lines. This one's four. I think it tells a great story. that You have all these winnings and you risk it all and you lose it, but you have the will to begin again and not dwell on that loss. Now, that's, that's, I don't think Kipling is promoting gambling here. I'm certainly not promoting gambling. But another kind of real world approach to this is just when I'm making this video now in 2021, we've seen a lot of people kind of lose their minds over things like Bitcoin and GameStop stock and Pokemon cards and real estate and the stock market and whatever it might be. And I think a lot of times people get hurt when they put so much into it. They're so afraid of missing out that they jump on the bandwagon when it's already too late. And instead, what might be better advice, at least according to the poem, is to realize that life will have, you know, disasters, as we talked about in the previous stanza, that sometimes you lose everything. And the best way to go about it is to just pick yourself up. And the second phrase of this stanza really brings that message home. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. So that idea of even though you've lost, to go at it again with all your might. And this imagery of sort of an athlete, heart and nerve and sinew, and the desire to go on even when your body says you're exhausted, but you keep running down the court or the field transitions very nicely into our final stanza. And this is the stanza I think most people remember. So we have this talk of kings, and one of the more confusing phrases in here, count with you, is an idiom. And basically it means people counting you as important or counting you as valuable. And that's something we all want, but I, I love the cautionary element of this phrase here. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, meaning that people find you valuable to be around but they don't depend on you so much, that you don't want to be a, a, a perfect hero in other people's eyes because the truth is none of us are perfect. We want to be seen as actual people. So I think that line does a great job of that. Now my favorite part of this poem, and I, a lot of people's favorite parts, is these final four lines where he says, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it and, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. So there you see that sort of biographical element where he's writing this potentially for his son as, as fatherly advice. The reason I love this last half of the final stanza is because I am a distance runner. I ran through high school and I ran in college for four years, cross country, indoor and outdoor track. So for a good eight years of my life, I was running every day, quite a bit sometimes too. And I still run, not quite as often now, um, as life has changed. But if you're a distance runner, 60 seconds is a very significant milestone. It has a very 400 meter feel to it, which is a single lap around the track. And, and I think that race in many ways epitomizes um, what track and field is all about. And when you break 60 seconds in the 400, that's a pretty big deal. You know, for most people, if you're if you're training consistently, you're going to do that early in high school, maybe even in middle school. Um, but for other people, it might take uh, even longer. But that's 15 miles an hour. I mean, that is that is booking it. A uh, 60 second 400 is, is not something you can just jump off the couch and do without any training. So that's kind of the image I have in my mind. I don't think that's what Kipling necessarily has here when he wrote this poem in the 1800s, but perhaps he did. That would have been a really fast 400 back in the day, I'm pretty sure. But um, Anyway, the idea of that of that race and that, that single race being a single minute is an interesting one. So anyway, even if Kipling's not going for the 400, it's a good representation because the 400 is a really tough race. Some people consider it the most difficult race in track and field. Now, I was a steeplechaser, so I might say differently, but... The 400 is a very hard race, and anytime I was called up to run the 4x4 relay, um, <laughs> I was kind of dreading it a little bit, because it's a tough one. Um, like a full sprint for a quarter mile. 
And that need to work really hard for a minute, I think is just so inspirational. You know, a minute of training does not make you a good distance runner. Being a good distance runner takes years of effort. But it starts with a minute, doesn't it? You have to run for 60 seconds before you can try and do a marathon, before you can try and break a four-minute mile, whatever you're going for. You have to start with 60 seconds worth of distance run. And while that's not the hardest thing in the world, a lot of people wouldn't do it. And focusing on anything for a minute isn't necessarily easy. Sometimes I see students in class who they start off doing well when we were going through a poem, but 35 seconds in, they've lost their focus. And that's natural. We, We tend to be easily distracted. But to do something that you really want to do, it often requires that element of focus. And if you can focus on something for 60 seconds, no matter what it is, then you've taken that first step. And no matter what you're trying to do in life, that first step is crucial. Without it, you never start. So I encourage you, if you're here for encouragement or inspiration as opposed to you have a quiz or test on this poem, we'll get to more analysis in just a second. I encourage you to think about starting with 60 seconds and not belittling the first step on a journey. It is something to celebrate. And apparently the world and everything's in it will be yours. <laughs> I don't know if I fully agree with that, but it's a powerful skill to be able to focus and something we have to train ourselves at. Okay, so to get into some more analysis of the poem here, that was a lot of reflection. And I don't usually do that, but I love this poem, so I hope I hope you are still with me here. I want to return to the first stanza where you have these first four lines rhyming with each other. And what I think they really do is set up a nice sense of anticipation. That's really how I describe this entire poem. Because you have rhyme, 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 and then there's not a rhyme, and then there's not a rhyme, then you have a rhyme. So that might be confusing. But until you get to the seventh line, after the first four, you don't have another rhyme. So you're always kind of waiting for it. It's sort of like he's hooked you in with four rhymes, and then you're like, okay, there's going to be a lot of rhymes. But then he always makes you wait a line. I think that really fits the pattern of the poem. If we return to the title in the English language, and in other languages as well, not all. But in the English language, the word if always goes with another word, then. If you hear the word if, you're always waiting for the then. Much like the rhymes that your inner ear is waiting for in this poem, the meaning of the poem, if, 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 how many ifs are in this poem? A lot. You're constantly waiting for the then. And I think that's what makes the ending so powerful. Because the then doesn't come until the second to last line. Now, you might notice there isn't a then there, and that's because we don't always say then. It's just implied in an if statement. So, for instance, you could have a sentence, if you don't get up, then you're going to be late. But colloquially, we would probably say, if you don't get up, you're going to be late. And the then becomes implied. But this statement is so ingrained in our language that it's even a math problem. A decade ago, I remember solving these problems. I can't tell you much about it. You'll have to find another channel for math help. But it's a a very, very common phrase in our language. And I, I just think it's an incredible title. I think Kipling has nailed the title on this one. And to keep us strung along for 30 lines before we get to the then statement, I think is a really smart choice. And I think the rhymes really do a nice job of matching that and the meaning and music of the poem work together. So I hope you enjoyed that reading summary and analysis of Rudyard Kipling's If. There's a whole lot more you can get into with this poem, Um, but hopefully you find it inspiring, even if it's just inspiring you to study a little more for that quiz or test you have on it. But if you're here just because you love poetry or inspirational poetry, uh, thank you so much for being here. I have a lot more videos that cover poems and all sorts of different topics literature related. So if you want to subscribe, it would really help me out. I would appreciate it. Otherwise, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Happy reading.